Good morning. Good morning. Let's go ahead and open with prayer. Father, we praise you and thank you for this day. We thank you for uh, the wonderful weather that you've given us. We thank you for giving us the opportunity again to gather as your people, to enjoy one another's fellowship and to hear your word. We pray that you would open the eyes of our hearts to behold wonderful things in your law, uh, that both now in Sunday school and in the service, your spirit would do its work with the word to transform us uh, into Christ's image, and that you would do the work that you seek to accomplish in us. In Christ's name I pray, amen. amen. So we are now on John chapter 11, and as I've uh, mentioned before, chapters 11 to 12 really are a uh, turning point in the gospel. This first half of the gospel is referred to as, and I've said this over and over again, it's the book of signs, right? Book of signs. <laughs> And in chapter 11, we get the sixth sign of the gospel, the next to last sign. Uh, the last sign, again, is the resurrection of Christ itself, which doesn't happen, of course, until uh, the end of the gospel. And so all of these signs are collectively pointing toward the resurrection, and they generally are, are escalated. Uh, so as we're going to see, you're all, you all are familiar with the story of Lazarus, the raising of a dead man. Uh, is about as, as clear a sign as you can get prior to the resurrection of Jesus himself. So beginning in John chapter 11, verse 1, Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So John introduces us here to three new characters. We have Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. Uh, the first two, that comment about Mary in verse two, it's Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment. We're going to see that later, actually. But what this suggests is, as so many other aspects of, of the gospel uh, suggest, John believed his audience already was familiar with what we call the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Or at least his audience was familiar with the material that eventually went into the production of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So he's assuming some knowledge on the part of his audience, which is why he, why this gospel looks so different from our other gospels. He's assuming that you've already read those or have some knowledge of those events, and you're bringing that here, and he's going to give a slightly different perspective on Jesus's ministry. So the sisters, verse 3, sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. So, of course, they want him to do something about this. They're familiar at this point with all of these other signs that Jesus has done. We've seen him repeatedly heal people. So come heal Lazarus, right? We need, we need your help. He whom you love is ill. Now, uh, just as a side note, notice how they refer to Lazarus. He whom you love. He whom you love. Now, on the one hand, uh, it's it's a, a simple statement of the Lord's affection for Lazarus and, of course, his affection for Mary and Martha as well. Uh, we'll look at Jesus' emotional life uh, a little bit in a moment. But uh, even more than that, he whom you love should remind you of something that will appear later in this gospel. Does anybody know what it is? John. John. So what, how do they refer to John, right? Right, the disciple whom Jesus loved. So beginning in chapter 13, you have the reference to the disciple whom Jesus loved. Without going into uh, an extensive discussion on this, there are all kinds of debates uh, in New Testament scholarship about the authorship of this gospel, as well as the other quote-unquote uh, Johannine writings for 2nd, 3rd John and Revelation. So there is a, a theory that the gospel of John is actually not the gospel of John, it's the gospel of Lazarus. Uh, so there are some scholars who would actually say that based on this, he's, this is the one whom Jesus loved, that the reference in uh, chapter 13 and, and following to the disciple whom Jesus loved is actually a reference to Lazarus. I don't personally buy this opinion. I take the traditional line that it is, in fact, John. But you will never see the disciple whom Jesus loved identified expressly as John in this gospel. Indeed, interestingly enough, you don't see John appear as a character in this gospel, which could go both ways. Some people argue that the very fact that he's not specifically mentioned means that he, the disciple whom Jesus loved must be John the Apostle. What about the, the style of writing as matches 
the epistles of John? Sure. Um, so there are obviously thematic similarities and there are stylistic similarities in the Greek, um, less so in Revelation, but you still see some of that. Of course, it's a different type of literature, so you expect it to be different. But um, yeah, so, so that would raise issues of one. Does that mean that if we determine the authorship of this gospel, that we've determined the authorship of the other writings? Or does it simply mean that, as some would suggest, these writings were part of a common school or community that was influenced by the writings of whoever wrote the Gospel of John. Um, that, that's a possibility. Uh, I, I can take the traditional line that I think the Gospel of John, for a second, there's John Revelation, were all written by the, the Apostle John. Um, possible that they weren't. That's not a point of orthodoxy, right? Someone could diverge on this point and he's still a, a consistently Christian position. But, um, but yeah, so, so my take is I tend to, tend to believe for other reasons uh, that the disciple whom Jesus loved is, in fact, John, especially as we get into the events surrounding uh, the resurrection and visiting the tomb, uh, that seems implausible to me that it's Lazarus. Um, but I, at least I thought I would point that out, that uh, it's interesting that you never have an express identification of the author of this book or of the disciple whom Jesus loved. So when Jesus heard it, verse 4, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, he says this illness does not lead to death, which might raise problems of uh, uh, Jesus' you know, how, how is that consistent with what happens later? Uh, because clearly, Lazarus does die. Um, but, of course, he's looking at the big picture. Uh, the point, when he says it does not lead to, right, the terminus, the point of this illness, is not so that Lazarus will die. Of course, Lazarus eventually did die, like everyone else. Um, he had to go through it twice. Uh, but the first time, the point is not so that he might die. The point is, as he says, for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. This is a parallel to what we previously saw when uh, Jesus healed the man uh, back in John chapter 9. And they were asking whether this man uh, was in this condition because of his sin or his parents' sin. And Jesus said, it's not for either. It's so that the, the glory of God might be displayed. And that's exactly what's going on here. The point of this illness is not, as in many other cases, to lead to the person's death. Very often illness is. God providentially uses illness to, to bring people to, the, uh, to, to their death. Um, but in this particular case, that's not what it's for. It's for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified. There's a sense in which, of course, everything in the world glorifies God. Everything is designed to glorify God. Uh, from him, through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever, as Paul says. But for John, as, as I said before, when we're talking about the glory of God, we're talking specifically about that glory that is manifested in Christ's resurrection in the second half of the book. So the first half of the book, again, is called the Book of Signs. The second half of the book is called the Book of glory, right? It's the book of glory. So this illness doesn't lead to death. That's not what it's for. It is designed to lead to the glory of God. That is to say, specifically, it's to point to the power of resurrection and specifically Christ's resurrection that is to come in the second half of the book. That's what it's for. It is, in other words, another sign. Verse five, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Again, there's the reaffirmation of Jesus's love for these people, his, his deep affection for them. Again, in a moment, we'll look a little bit more at Jesus' emotional life, but uh, we don't want to pass over that. Um, sometimes there's the tendency to look at it from the outside, and we see what Jesus is doing. We see Jesus' miracles. We see his ministry, and we overlook that uh, he, remember, took on a human nature. He, he has all of the emotional range uh, that belongs to, to humanity, and so he felt this, right? He felt his love for Lazarus and Martha and Mary. Um, this moved him. But interestingly, verse 6, he doesn't give the response that we might expect. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. So he loves them, and consequently, verse 6, it begins with that word so, right? So he loves them, and consequently, when he hears that Lazarus is ill, he doesn't is ill, he doesn't immediately go to him. He doesn't immediately go to this family and comfort them. He doesn't go immediately and heal Lazarus. That's what we would, of course, expect. That's what everyone else is going to expect, as we'll see later. 
but he doesn't. He stays two days, two days longer in the place where he was. But John doesn't want us to miss that the fact that Jesus stays two days, days longer in the place where he was is not in conflict with his love for Lazarus or Mary or Martha. It is perfectly consistent with his love for them. Indeed, it's his love for them that causes him to delay two days. It's in their best interests that he delays two days. That's, of course, difficult uh, uh, for us, I think, in not only narratives like this, but personal experience. Uh, we don't know why God delays in certain ways. Um, and sometimes it seems like it's too late or time is passing or whatever. Uh, and yet, uh, delays are because Jesus loves his people. Verse 7, then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? The issue here, of course, is Judea in the south is in the strict sense where those people identified as the Jews reside, and they are hostile to Jesus and his disciples. Uh, some folks here would see a, a conflict, I think appropriately, reasonably so, between those uh, Israelites who lived in the northern areas. Jesus, remember, is from Galilee. He grew up in Galilee. And those who are in the area around Jerusalem and Judea uh, who are seeking to kill Jesus. And so they don't, the disciples don't want to go back down there. They don't want to go back to, to this southern region. They don't want to go back to Judea and Jerusalem. And they think, well, if we do, we're all going to get killed. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Now, Jesus, as usual, we've seen this repeatedly over and over and over again. He, he speaks figuratively and cryptically using con, uh, concrete language. We've seen the language of light and dark before. And here he's suggesting that are there not 12 hours in a day? You have a limited, set, finite period of time in which to fulfill his ministry. And Jesus himself, of course, is the light of this world, as he's previously, previously said. So as long as he, the light of the world, is ministering in the world prior to his death and resurrection, they have to be about this business. They have to be about this work so that they will not, as he says, stumble. On the other hand, once that light is gone, once that is deprived, denied to people, they will stumble because, as he says, the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. So still speaking figuratively, we all know uh, that Lazarus wasn't just asleep. He died. He didn't need to just be woken up. He needed to be raised from the dead. Um, but Jesus is using these images again figuratively, trying to get them to understand the disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll recover. Like every other instance where we've seen with the Samaritan woman or Nicodemus, they interpret the concrete language literally, and therefore they misunderstand the deeper spiritual significance of this, that Jesus is this light of the world who, as light, brings resurrection life. And as the one who brings resurrection life, uh, he raises the dead, and they should be connecting these dots, but they're not at this point. Then Jesus told them plainly, verse 14, all right, so uh, verse 13, now Jesus has spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. Verse 14, then Jesus told them plainly. So now they're not getting it. They're not getting the figurative language. So as so often before, Jesus has to just come out and say it directly. Lazarus has died. He's dead, right? He's not asleep. He's dead. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So Jesus here sets up the, the reasoning. He earlier indicated, again, John indicated that it's because he loved these people, Lazarus, Mary, Martha, indeed he loved his disciples, which is why he delays. And now he's saying, I'm glad I wasn't there. That's for a purpose. I wasn't there. This had to happen, not because I intend harm to them, not because I intend harm to you, but so that you may believe and remember all of the signs in this gospel are connected with belief. John 20, 30 run, these things have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. So, Michael, what, yes, what is the point in Jesus speaking figuratively because no one ever gets it? Right. <laughs> yeah. So what's the point of even going down right, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Mm. Why well, do it over and over and over again? Yeah. Yeah. So I think that one of the things that he's doing is part, partly that is the point. And so it, there's a parallel. It's not exact, but there's a parallel in the synoptics where uh, Jesus uh, speaks in parables. And one of the reasons he speaks in parables particularly is it's judgment on those who are spiritually blind. It's to seal them, as it were, in their blindness and hard hardness. So it functions that way in one regard. Uh, in another respect, I think that for those who do come to understand, as the disciples eventually come to understand here, it highlights their slowness and their unwillingness to read the world from a spiritual perspective. So if you feed someone a concrete image, their knee-jerk reaction is to interpret it literally and to view the world within that frame. And John is saying, or Jesus is saying, he's not doing that. He's, his default assumption is to read the world through the frame of spiritual realities, and then you work your way back. And so the fact that they're caught up in the literal and the concrete, that's an indication of where their mindset is. They're not automatically knee-jerk reaction thinking about spiritual. Also, I think that Jesus here is connecting all of these concrete images that have already existed in the Old Testament and that exist in creation itself to the event of his resurrection. So Jesus isn't severing the natural world and all of those concrete realities from the spiritual. And so when we see light, he wants us to think, okay, sunlight's a wonderful thing. It's a good thing. It's a natural thing, but it's also telling us something more profound about the world. It's pointing us to the God who created it. And it's also therefore in our context pointing to the Christ who was raised from the dead. And so he's giving us these concrete images so that when we see them, we're reminded of them and our thoughts are led back to heavenly things. Uh, at least that's what I, th I think is probably going on. Yes. Uh, another, probably wrong hypothesis that I've always had is that as Jesus is presenting uh, to the disciples and everybody else is here, just like us, we don't understand the Word of God until we are regenerated through the Holy Spirit. These disciples begin to understand slowly as they grew in the Spirit. So it takes the Holy Spirit, and everybody else didn't have it, so it sounded like vain rhetoric to me. Sure, sure, sure. That's right, yeah. So again, just like the parables to people that do not have the Spirit, it, it seals them in their blindness, they don't get it. Um, for those who are, uh, it can actually be a, a useful tool, as we've seen before, whether it's talking about water or talking about light. Even if they don't initially get the point, they still understand the nature of the concrete image and by way of analogy that can help illuminate the spiritual realities that they don't quite understand. So everybody understands what water is. Everybody understands what light is. And so even if they don't see the initial connection between those concrete realities and the spiritual one, they can at least in some sense, as Jesus builds the argument, see the connection between those concrete realities and, and the spiritual ones. And so they, you know, you think again of the qualities of light and if Jesus is connecting himself to light, well, that tells us something about Jesus. Uh, if you have the connection between the wind and the spirit, the nature of the wind tells us something about the spirit. The nature of water tells us something about the washing of regeneration and so on. Um, so you're leading people by steps from the concrete reality that they're kind of bound up in, that they understand with which they're familiar to those deeper spiritual realities. All right, anything else on that? Michael. Yes. No. <laughs> uh, Paul Uncle Phil's observation. As we know it today, at this point in time, as we understand being a Christian, were the disciples Christians yet? Uh, so yeah, so that's a, a really good question. Um, it's not a dumb question at all. Uh, well, um, it's it, a really good question. It seems it kind of feels weird. Yeah, it, it, it can feel weird. Um, so my the answer is. Um, a qualified yes. And what I mean by that is the covenant of grace is substantially the same in its old and new covenant forms. Right? It's the same covenant of grace. The outward administration of that covenant is different, but the, but the, the substance of it is the same. So these disciples, did they actually believe in the promises of God? And the only way they could come to that conclusion is even in the Old Testament, was through a supernatural work of, of God, his saving grace. 
And the answer is yes, they had. They had experienced that. They are, that's why they're following Jesus. They really do believe the promises. And so they are, in that sense, Christians in the way that, say, Abraham was a Christian, in the way that, say, John the Baptist was a Christian who's the last of the Old Testament prophets, according to the Gospels, right? He, he's, he's in your New Testament, but in the timeline of redemptive history, John is actually the last of the Old Testament uh, prophets. So Abraham, in Galatians chapter 3, Paul tells us he believed the gospel. It specifically tells us that he believed the gospel. Well, if you define a Christian as someone who believes the gospel, then yeah, Abraham was a Christian. The disciples, do they believe the gospel, the good news that God had promised in the Old Testament? Well, yeah. And so it, it, if they had died, would they have been uh, uh, saved, as it were? Then the answer is yes. Um, they, are, they are God's people. Um, so on the one hand, I would say yes. On the other hand, uh, it's qualified because sometimes we limit the term Christian uh, to describe those members of the covenant of grace uh, who are living on the other side of the outpouring of the Spirit at Pentecost. Because the New Testament church, under its New Testament administration, was established at Pentecost when Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father, pours out the Spirit on his church. So up until Pentecost, you don't have the church in its new covenant administration, and therefore you don't have, uh, in the narrow sense, Christians, if you define it again as, as new covenant believers. Um, so I, I want to emphasize the continuity over the discontinuity, because we live in a, particularly because we live in a context where people tend to emphasize the discontinuity over the continuity. We live in a world where, uh, particularly because the largest uh, non-Roman Catholic influence uh, on the United States are, is Baptists. And so Baptists are going to see greater discontinuity between uh, Old and New Testaments. And that tends to seep into the surrounding church culture, even in Presbyterian churches. And people think, oh, well, that was Old Testament. Those people were different from us. And really, in substance, no, they weren't. Um, they believed the same gospel that we believe. Uh, they were just under a different administration. All right, so back to, let's see. Da, da, da. Verse 16, so Jesus tells them, of course, after Jesus tells them Lazarus has died and we're going back, Thomas, called the twin, this is also, of course, the one that we know as Doubting Thomas, uh, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. On the one hand, this is inspiring. This is inspiring to see Thomas's courage that he's telling his fellow disciples, look, Jesus wants to go back to Judea. We know we're going to get killed. Let's go die with him, right? We're, we're all in on this. So there's a, something about that that is an expression of genuine faith. But on the other hand, as we see later, Thomas um, has, a, has a reluctance to believe in, in what he doesn't see, right? Uh, he has to see it to believe it. And so on the one hand, yes, there's an expression of faith here, and this is, is courageous, and that's wonderful. Uh, on the other hand, he still doesn't get it. Jesus has just indicated that we're going so that God will be glorified, so that he can raise Lazarus, so that he goes to, as he says, awaken him. And that's none of that's registering with Thomas. He just doesn't see it. He thinks, in his mind, he's like certain that we're going to go back and we're all going to get killed. <laughs> and that's it. So on the one hand, yes, inspiring. On the other hand, it's, it's uh, blindness still to what Jesus is trying to accomplish. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for days. Uh, of course, later we'll see Jesus, of course, is in the tomb for three days, uh, part of the first day, second day, part of the third, and he's raised on the third day. The reason for that, in part, is because the common belief uh, in this community in the first century that that's when you would know definitively that the spirit had departed. That person is dead, right? It has to be four days. So it's not that there's any possibility that the spirit is still lingering around the body and the person is resuscitated. No, this, this guy's dead, right? Everybody's going to agree, this guy's dead. Uh, it's beyond question. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brothers. So they have all these friends and family who come around to comfort them uh, because of the death of Lazarus. 
And this is important because not only do you have the circumstances under which Jesus is going to manifest his glory in this sort of penultimate way prior to his own resurrection, but you also have an audience. You have a huge audience. And that's important for Jesus to manifest his glory at this sort of final stage of this book of signs is he's got a substantial audience. And we're going to see later that that's important because that audience is going to respond in a couple of different ways to what happens here. And that really is sort of the breaking point uh, between those who follow Jesus and those who don't within the, the Jewish community here. Verse 20, so when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, uh, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. On the one hand, again, this is an expression of faith. She believes Jesus could have healed Lazarus. She's seen the signs over and over and over again. On the other hand, that's a hard thing to, to live with. That's a really hard thing to live with. Is He says he loves us. He could have shown up here and healed my brother. But now my brother's dead. Where were you? Uh, of course, I think for, for a lot of us, that, that is uh, something that uh, a sentiment that we have experienced before uh, in life. Again, we see things uh, not coming to, to fruition or, 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 or our prayers not being answered in the way that we hope. Um, and it's some, in some ways with Martha saying, Lord, if you'd been here, this wouldn't have happened. Um, what, what's going on? And yet, on the other side of this, she doesn't lose her faith, right? She still is confident in the Lord, verse 22. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Hinting, perhaps, that she thinks that somehow, even if it's beyond her comprehension, this, this, this situation can do, still be solved, right? This problem can still be solved. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. So he directly tells her, your, Lazarus is going to rise again. He's not going to remain in the tomb. Uh, but in her mind, she still can't grasp the idea of Jesus raising a dead man, right? We've seen points where Jesus raised previously uh, a boy in chapter, uh, at the end of uh, John chapter 4, a boy who was at the point of death. That's the closest we've ever come to this. He raised a boy who was at the point of death, but to raise, actually raise a dead man is an entirely different thing. And so she says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. In her mind, Jesus is basically telling her, well, uh, you know, you need to maintain your confession of faith. Uh, as a good, faithful believer in God's Old Testament promises, you believe in a future resurrection, as many Jews in the first century did on the basis of certain Old Testament texts. There's going to be a future resurrection on the last day. She says, I, I believe that. But Jesus says to her, and she, she still doesn't get it, um, she looks at resurrection as a historical event that is in the future. That's the way she's processing this. Resurrection is a historical event that takes place in the future. Jesus is going to say, re the resurrection isn't an event, it's a person, me. He is the resurrection. It's not that the resurrection is, in some exclusive sense, a future event. Jesus himself is the resurrection. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. So he establishes this firm connection between union with Christ by faith. Christ himself is eternal life, and therefore anybody who is united to Christ by faith possesses that eternal life now and always. Whatever physical circumstances might intervene, including physical death, it doesn't matter because that person is united to the one who is life itself. And everyone, he said, uh, verse 26, and everyone who lives and believes in me, he says, shall never die. Do you believe this? Notice her response. So he's asking her, do you believe that I'm the one who contains within me resurrection life? Do you believe that everyone who believes in me possesses that life so that whatever physically might happen in between, it's all going to be good because that person possesses eternal life? And her answer is, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. John here is giving us a hint into the content uh, of the Christian faith at, at its core. So remember, she says, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. 
John 20, 31, why is the book written? That you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. It's the exact word. Okay? So what she believes here is what John is trying to get his entire readership, his entire audience to believe, that you are the Christ, the Son of God. He adds, uh, she adds here, who is coming into the world, which is an allusion back to John chapter 1, where we are told that the true light, which enlightens every man, was coming into the world. So... In other words, the content of the Christian faith from John chapter 1 all the way to that statement in John chapter 20 is expressed here in believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and when she says the one who is coming into the world, it's a shorthand way of saying you're the one that John talks about in his prologue, John chapter 1, the eternal Son of God who created all things. Now, she believes that. And that has certain implications, right? So if you believe that, if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, he is the Messiah, the promised Old Testament figure who's going to save his people from their sins, if you believe that he's the Son of God, if you believe that he is indeed God himself and the creator of all things, then it follows that you're going to believe that he is the source of all life. That to have faith in him, to be united to him, is to possess that life. So those are basic components of the Christian faith uh, as far as John is concerned. Um, those are the items without which you can't have Christianity. Right? You can't have a Christianity without Christ. You, have, you can't have a Christianity without Christ being who he says he is, the Son of God, and indeed the creator of the world. And you can't have a Christianity without having resurrection life. Verse 28, when she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Same thing that Martha says. They're in that same space where they think, what's going on? Why did you delay? Right? Where is your love for us in that? Now, verse 33, here's how Jesus responds. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And then, of course, just jumping over for a moment, verse 35, shortest verse in the Bible, uh, one of the most familiar, Jesus wept. Right? He's moved in his spirit, he's greatly troubled, troubled, and he weeps. There's a Talking about the emotional life of our Lord, I want to stop there for a moment. Uh, I've already mentioned his love and affection for these people, but don't pass over this. Right? Jesus is fully human, and he feels this when uh, Mary and indeed Martha come to him, and they don't know why he delayed. They don't know why Lazarus is dead, and they are grieved over it, and that moves him. Now, you might think, well, he could have solved that problem by showing up earlier. Again, he's going to use this to demonstrate his glory, which is more important. But those things aren't incompatible. You, God, Christ, can have a higher end, a higher spiritual end, the manifestation of his glory and the good of his people spiritually long term. And that can lead to short term pain and suffering. And Jesus still has sympathy with those in that pain and suffering. He still grieves with them. We still have a high priest who sympathizes with our weaknesses. He, he may have to deny us some uh, short term good for something that's in the long term better. But even as we suffer in the short term, he's still sympathizing with us. That still moves him. Uh, more, more importantly here, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the psychology behind why Jesus, uh, when it says that he's moved in his spirit, the language there is actually suggests not mere sorrow. Primarily, uh, what's going on here is an intense anger. The term here suggests intense anger. And now that anger isn't external, it's in his spirit. It's this internal, intense anger. And that anger is, is, is basically, uh, as Warfield will call it, irrepressible. He just can't hold back that anger within him. And it spills over, and it says that he's greatly troubled, which has the idea of this disturbance in his soul, and perhaps then even working its way out into his body, right? He's shaking with anger. And when he can't control that, right, because he's, he has this natural human response, which is appropriate and good and, and, and no way sinful, 
he he doesn't hold that back. He's shaking with anger, and he ends up bursting out in tears, and he weeps. So you see the chain of events there within Jesus' own soul, his own internal life. There's a great essay, and you can find it for free online. Um, and so you can look it up if you want later. Uh, written by B.B. Warfield. It's called The Emotional Life of Our Lord. And in The Emotional Life of Our Lord, Warfield describes... Uh, he goes through the, all of the Gospels and shows in detail all of the different emotions that Jesus felt. And the highlight, of course, the point of this essay is to say Jesus was fully human and he sympathizes with your weaknesses. He knows what it feels like to experience things like joy and pain and sadness and all of these, these varied emotions. When he talks about this, he, he actually talks about this passage at length, and he points out, I think rightly, that contextually, what elicited Jesus' anger? Why is Jesus so angry? He's not angry. Oh, yes. Well, I think you're, well, keep going. I think you're going for a Okay, sure, sure. Uh, he, he's, not, he's not angry at um, Mary for weeping. That's a normal thing, and Jesus himself weeps, right? That's not, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a perfectly normal, appropriate response, and we have to say that because um, in Former times, you had uh, Stoicism and its influence even on some aspects of Christian philosophy that suggested, well, it's wrong to weep. It's wrong to cry. Well, no, it's, it's Jesus does. It's perfectly appropriate. That's not why he's angry. He's not angry uh, because you have these supporters who are seeking to console Mary and who are weeping along with her. There's nothing wrong with that. We mourn with those who mourn. Contextually, the issue here that Jesus is trying to resolve is the problem he's trying to deal with is death itself. Remember, in his resurrection, Jesus is dealing with sin, death, and Satan. He's dealing here with death, and of course, the one who has the power of death, Hebrews chapter 2, that is the devil. Jesus is looking at death as his enemy, and he's looking at the one behind death at this point, namely the devil, and he's saying, I hate my enemy. I am angry with death. I am angry with Satan. I'm angry what this has done to the world. I'm angry at what this has done to my friend and to my friend's family. I love these people. And indeed, this is something that's not only happening here, but it's happening all over the world. People are still living under the consequences of a sinful fallen world. And they're living under this apparent tyranny of death. And it grieves him and it makes him angry. And so that anger then again, Results in, in, in this just so bursting forth. looking at all the sins of the world caused by the fall and the, the well, is, liar behind it. That's right. Was this based on the language of the original writing? Who came up with this theory of, the, of why he's angry? Yeah, yeah so. He, he, Oh, no, the, so the, the term itself, when it says he's deeply moved, there are other versions that will uh, indicate that he's, he's moved with indignation. Um, so the, the term itself expresses indignation. In fact, uh, it's used in only one other passage in the New Testament in the Gospel of Mark. And in that passage, it is conjoined with an expression of anger or wrath. So the term itself suggests uh, anger. Uh, I think that's appropriate. So the question isn't whether Jesus is, is moved with anger here. The question is, why is he angry? Um, and, and so the best we can do is contextually, it seems here, certainly within the context of the gospel as a whole, what is Jesus after? And we can compare this again to uh, 1 John, for example, uh, where we're told what Jesus was doing. He came to do what? To destroy the works of the devil. So he came to destroy the works of the devil. He's angry and he's grieved over what's going on here. Um, does that make sense? Any other questions or comments on that? That's a reference in Luke that you just mentioned. That was when Christ was in the looking at Jerusalem. So you do have him weeping over Jerusalem for similar reasons, right? So he's seeing that you're the ones who have stoned the prophets and killed those who were sent to you. But the specific reference is in uh, to the same verb as in Mark. And I have to get the exact chapter. It's in Mark. I can't remember the reference. Uh, Warfield has it in his discussion. Uh, but the, the particular point for Warfield there is uh, this term is conjoined in that context with an, uh, an expression indicating clearly wrath and anger. So it seems to suggest that it's part of that same semantic uh, domain. It has the same kind of sense to it. 
So it seems uh, most plausible, I think, Warfield is right here, that this is uh, Jesus's anger at sin, death, and Satan, and it, and it pours over into weeping. And so he asked in verse 34, he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved them. And that's an appropriate response. It is an expression of his love for Lazarus. See how he loved them. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Again, there's the thing that's in the mind of Mary and Martha. Other people are thinking the same thing. He loved him, but if he loved him so much, why did he delay? If he loved him so much, why didn't he come when he could have solved the problem instead of later? Well, Jesus is going to answer that question in the following verses based on his, his actions here. Then Jesus deeply moved again. That's that same verb, right? He's, he's deeply moved. He's agitated. He's angry at the situation. He came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor for, he's been, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you, that if you believed, you would see the glory of God. There again is the connection between earlier, between belief on the one hand and the resurrection life on the other. And here Jesus is connecting this to belief on the one hand and the glory of God on the other, suggesting again that the glory of God in view is not this generic glory, but the glory of God in the Gospel of John is particularly the glory of resurrection life. If you believe, you will experience and have this resurrection life. And he's going to demonstrate and manifest this. You just have to trust. So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. So Jesus, of course, is, is engaged here in this uh, communication with the Father, not primarily for his own sake. Of course, we know Jesus uh, praise frequently, but it's particularly for those standing around that you may that they may believe that you sent me. Again, everything that Jesus is doing is trying to derive, drive his audience to believe in Jesus as the source of resurrection power. He wants it to be apparent that this is not an accident, it's not a coincidence, that I was sent by the Father, and I have this gift that I can give to you, if only you would believe and trust me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth, so he's looking almost like a mummy here. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. This is again a sign, and so it doesn't terminate in itself. It is designed to point us to some spiritual reality. Everything that we see here, remember, is pointing us to some deeper, profound spiritual reality. Lazarus is bound by the cords of death. Right? We see this language even in, in the Psalms, for example. He's bound by the cords of death. And Jesus has the power to unbind those who are bound by the cords of death. This is pointing to his own resurrection, and of course it's pointing to the resurrection on the last day that he's already referenced, and it is a call to everyone around him, I can save you from sin and its consequences. I can save you ultimately from sin and its consequences, if you will only believe in me. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Two camps of people. You have a, huge, a substantial audience here, which is why Jesus is doing this, right? He knows he's going to have a substantial audience. He has this, this, this sizable audience, and you have two responses. Some believe in him. That's what Jesus is trying to elicit from them, right? Believe in me. And then there are others who are snitches, right? They're going to look at it instead of saying, well, maybe this is who he is, who he says he is. Maybe we ought to trust and follow him. They look at it and they see a problem. He's continuing to do this, these signs and he's getting more and more followers. And that's a problem for us, which is, of course, seems to be insane. If a man has the power over life and death, you follow him. Uh, but for some reason, they, they are going to go back and they're going to, they're going to cast in their lot with the Pharisees and they're going to tattle on Jesus. It does, exactly. And we're going to see that in a moment, which again is insane because you're going to die anyway, right? It doesn't make any sense, right? So you have one guy who has the power of life and death. You have other people who have uh, temporal power and you're going to 
throwing your lot with people who merely have temporal power and not with the one who has the power of life and death. It doesn't make any sense. But that's exactly what they're going to do. Um, so the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we, are to, what are we to do uh, for this man performs many signs? They acknowledge that he's performing the signs. It's not like they're ignorant about this. It's not like they don't know what's going on. It's not even that they don't believe he's really doing them. They don't say, oh, well, no, that didn't really happen. This is all fake. Right? It's, it's, it's just some, some trick. It's magic, right? Um, that's not what they say. They recognize that Jesus is performing signs. They recognize, they see with their own eyes, they have reliable eyewitness testimony as to what is going on, and they still refuse to follow him. Why? What's the reason for this? Verse 48, this is the reason. If we let him go on like this, uh, doing things like raising people from the dead, healing sick people, everyone will believe in him. Why is that a problem, right? We, shouldn't you want that? Yes, okay, if he keeps uh, raising people from the dead, people are going to keep believing in, in him. That's a good thing. Where's the problem? Here it is. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. That's the problem. Just what Phil mentioned, right? It's, this, it's the temporal realities that they are bound up. Their entire identity is connected to our place and our nation. So we are located, we have our, our power in Jerusalem. We exercise still, even the Roman rule, some control here. We enjoy the temporal benefits of it. We maintain our unbelievably distinct identity, our absolute identity from these Gentile nations. And we're going to lose that. Right? If he keeps doing what he's doing, we're going to lose this. They're not wrong. That's, that's the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, right? They're not wrong, but we'll see this in a moment. It's, it's a bit ironic. They're concerned about losing their place and their nation, which they would not have done if they had followed Jesus. If they had actually followed Jesus, they would have saved their place and their nation. It's precisely because they didn't that the events of AD 70 occur. It's precisely because they reject their own Messiah that he expresses his wrath using the Romans as an instrument to take away their place and their nation. That's the tragedy, is they could have had their cake and eaten it too. They could have had it all, and they lost both. Verse 49, but one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, right? So they're worried about this. They're thinking, oh, what's, uh, the Romans are going to come in if he keeps doing this. Nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. So Caiaphas, on the one hand, he says, look, you, you guys don't see the opportunity here. Right? We already have an uneasy relationship with the Romans. If we deal with this guy, then we're going to be able to obtain some favor from the Romans. They're going to leave us alone. It's a win-win, right? All we have to do is sacrifice this one man. Everybody else gets to be fine, and we get to go on uh, as things work. Again, that's, that's completely and utterly foolish, but Caiaphas is speaking more truth than he knows. Verse 51, he did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. Caiaphas speaks more truly than he knows when he says that one man dies for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. That instead of having the entirety of either Israel destroyed or indeed of any of the Gentile nations destroyed, they can be preserved. A remnant of those nations can be preserved by virtue of union with Christ by faith. We don't have to die for our sins. Nations don't have to die for their sins because we already have one man who did, and he's the only one indeed who could satisfy the wrath of God. This is uh, a fairly clear expression of what we would call penal substitutionary atonement, that Jesus dies on behalf of his people. He bears the wrath of God for the sins of his people in himself so that they don't have to. Verse 53, so from that day on, they made plans to put him to death, and there's the, the turning point. We've already seen them previously try to stone him. We've, see, we've previously seen a hostility express, expressed toward Jesus, but it is at this point, it's at this climactic point that the Sanhedrin determines in their minds, the council determines in its mind, its collective mind, that this man's going to die, 
right? We just have to plan it out, but this man's going to die. Yes? So Caiaphas is speaking purely temporally here. So he has some sort of greater view in his mind. I, I, I hold a view. I think it's, it's, uh, it's uh, a coincidental. It's, it's, it's uh, well, not coincidental, but it's um, not intentional on his part. Uh, so I think it is prophecy, but the prophecy is connected, as John says here, being high priest that year. John includes that little uh, uh, participial clause, being high priest that year. With respect to his office, he's prophesying, but he as a person consciously does not know he's prophesying. Uh, so he's fulfilling the office of prophet without intentionally doing so. Um, so he's speaking in one, one, at one level, and he's thinking, okay, this one man, we kill him, we get rid of him. Um, and, and of course, we have John's statement there, verse 51, he didn't say this of his own accord. Right? He didn't intentionally do this. Uh, but he is prophesying by virtue of his office. So if you go on in that, you know, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, mm. not for the nation all, only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. I mean, it, like, like, like why, why would he have said that if, if he didn't, if he just thought Jesus was just some prophet who would... Well, notice... That? Um, so, so notice in uh, verse 52, the part where it says not for the nation only, but also together into one of the children of God who are scattered abroad. Um, it doesn't put that in quotation mark. That's not a quote from Caiaphas. So the quote from Caiaphas is simply, uh, you know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. Okay. What, what John is doing is he's illustrating again that in Caiaphas's mind, what he means by the nation is ethnic Israel, and he's saying we kill this one man, Jesus, and we get to maintain our place and our position, ethnic Israel's identity. And John is saying he spoke more truly than he knew that there is a nation spiritually that God is gathering, namely the church, and that includes not only those from the nation of Israel, but from every Gentile nation under earth. And so you have them brought into one head. Um, so, so Caiaphas isn't thinking that. He's not thinking, oh, well, Jesus is going to die as a penal substitute. And then he's going to gather from all the corners of the globe a group of people to, to belong to his spiritual kingdom. Um, but that's, that's how John is interpreting it as, as a prophecy. Okay, so that's he's right. just interpreting that one statement. He's interpreting that. This is that. not something, I, mm. I guess I read it like... As like he's going on and talking. Well, it was, you know, I guess it says, being high priest that year, he prophesied. Like, I thought it meant he had previously oh, I see. made this... this prophecy about Jesus and what would happen and all that, and then he was just kind of coming back. Right, no, so when it says, yeah, he prophesied, it's expositing, the, the verse uh, 50 is the prophecy, and he's he's prophesying there as high priest, and, and John then is explaining what's going on there in verse 51 and 52. Um, verse 54, Jesus therefore no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness to a town called Ephraim, and there he stayed with the disciples. Uh, this is the calm before the storm. Uh, we're about to head into uh, chapter 12. And then uh, remember chapter 12, uh, well, actually, let's look at uh, verse 55. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus and saying to one another as they stood in the temple, what do you think, that he will not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know so that they might arrest him. So again, this is the calm before the storm. This is the moment before the big fight that Jesus is going sort of into his corner with his disciples. The Pharisees are over here in their corner and they're plotting uh, how they're going to kill Jesus and they're ready for him whenever he shows up. And then you have the audience around saying, where's Jesus at, right? Is he going to show up? Because everybody's expecting the conflict, right? Everybody shows up to the race to watch the car crash, right? And that's what they're kind of, everybody's looking for this and saying, is he going to show up? And if he shows up, what's going to happen? And so John is leaving us here. Uh, there's a little bit of a, a cliffhanger uh, before we get into to chapter 12, where we'll start to see the uh, events of the, the last week of Jesus's life. And I want you to think about the proportional, uh, the, the, how, the proportions of John's focus here. He spent 11 chapters uh, building up from, from prologue to resurrection of Lazarus, building up all of these signs concerning the question of who Jesus is, and he's going to spend 13 uh, or even 12 all the way to the end of the book on one week, right? One week of Jesus's life. What does that tell us? The gospels and particularly this gospel 
they're not purely biographies. Sometimes scholars will categorize them as, as, as biographies in the first century since, but they're not really that. They share similarities with biographies, but they're not trying to give a detailed account of Jesus' entire life. The point of the gospel is the death and resurrection of Jesus. That is the point. Everything is driving toward that end, and you see that with the other gospels as well, but it's particularly prominent here because half the book is devoted to one week. It's not about Jesus' life as a whole in all its details. It is about his death and resurrection. And that's what uh, John is driving us toward, and that's what Jesus is driving us toward. All right, well, in there, does anybody have any questions or comments on, on either this chapter or anything that we've discussed up to this point? I think it's just interesting, like, going back to the, the emotional stuff sure. and about, like, how did he do that? Because, you know, you would think he's kind of sitting there going, I got this. Yeah. You know, y'all, y'all chill out. Yeah. Versus, you know, he actually joined them yeah. in grieving and weeping. Yeah. I, that, I kind of can't put that together. Right. Yeah. It, it, it seems like kind of odd because you think. But, but at, at the same time, um, there's a complexity, and, and of course it's even more complex in his case, given his identity, but there's a complexity to human emotions um, that even if we feel like and we genuinely believe something is going to turn out okay, even as we're going through it, we still feel the pain. We still feel the sorrow. It doesn't alleviate that. Mm-hmm. And so Jesus can look at it and say, he knows he's going to raise this man from the dead. That's why he showed up. That's why he came. He came to raise him from the dead. It doesn't deal with the fact that there really is pain, there really is sorrow, there really is death in the world. It doesn't make an it doesn't make it an illusion or uh, some sort of just dream or fantasy or some nightmare we had. It's not a nightmare; it's real. Um, That really Lazarus really was dead, and so um, he feels all of that. And that, of course, is one of the reasons John tells us this. One of the reasons Hebrews teaches this, and one of the reasons Warfield wrote that article is because that's a huge comfort. Uh, that's a huge comfort to know that we have a high priest who indeed uh, sympathizes with our weaknesses in the full sense that he feels those emotions. He gets that. Yes? One remarkable thing about Lazarus in, in this part of the 11 is the demonstration of the absolute sovereignty and power that Christ has over all things. Yep. And the simple come forth. Right, which connects with, right, right. So, so earlier in the prologue, John had connected light and life. When Jesus explains to his disciples why they have to go back, he puts it in terms of light and dark, and then he raises a man from the dead. Well, what is that telling us? It's that clear expression of all of the I am statements we have seen up to this point. I am the resurrection of life. Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. He is the God who created. He's the God who brought light out of darkness, and he's the God who created life and therefore can restore it. Uh, that's the that's one of the crucial points, which of course is again the confession that you see there. I believe that you are Christ, the Son of God, the one who is coming into the world. Right? I believe that you are indeed the God who created all things. Well, with that, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Uh, Father, we do thank you for uh, revealing your Son to us in your Word. We're especially thankful when we read passages like this to know that we have a sympathetic High Priest who understands our weaknesses and who comforts us in our afflictions and who feels the emotions that so many of us feel of rejoicing or pain and everything in between. Lord, we pray that we would be encouraged this morning uh, as we hear these words and indeed as we uh, go to worship you this morning and hear your word proclaimed and come to your table. Pray that you would strengthen and nourish us and that you would set our eyes on those heavenly things knowing that Uh, We indeed have a Savior who is fully able and willing to save. In Christ's name I pray, amen.